Let me see if it has a date on it. 1970. Okay. So, arranged 74. I don't know, maybe a musician knows the difference between 70 and what it means by arranged 74. But anyways, so mid-70s, this was a hot one. And I was in church, and some of you weren't, maybe, and some of you uh, were, but uh, love was when. God became a man. Love was when God became a man. Locked in time and space without rank or place. Love was God, born of Jewish kin. Just a carpenter with some fishermen. Love was when Jesus walked in history. Lovingly he brought a new life that's free. Love was God, nailed to blade and die. And love one such as I. Love was when God became man. Down where I could see love that reached to me. Love was God dying for my sin. And so trapped was I, my whole world came in. Love was when Jesus rose to walk with me. Lovingly he brought a new life that's free. Love was God, only he could try. Love one such as I. Amen. Those were good days in the 70s. Amen. You remember the 70s? Good days. And you know it's in the Christmas section of the, of the book. So, well, it's one, it's one past the Christmas. So it's close. <laughs> they didn't quite know where to put it. <laughs> but the words of that Song is what I want to talk about. Love was when God became a man. And the message today is lessons in love. Father, we ask, O oh God, today that, Lord, you would grant the unction that is needed by the Holy Spirit to touch your servant, Lord, and grant him the grace and the ability to share the word of the Lord as you would have it. We ask, O oh God, today for all those that are watching at home who need encouragement in their souls, that, Lord, you would be very close to them today. Minister to the depth of their need and depth of their hearts. And, Lord, we ask, O oh God, that in this service you would continue to be glorified Lord, we pray for this Christmas season, for those that are celebrating, Lord, that don't even know what they're really celebrating. We pray that the message of Christ would get through to them and help us to be a witness of that amazing story that we're sharing about this morning. We pray for our loved ones, Lord, especially that are close to us, Lord, who, who have not yet come to faith in Christ Jesus. And we pray for them, Lord, that they would come to that glorious faith and they would kneel at the manger, the gift of God. We pray for our leaders of this nation, Lord, even as they pause for Christmas and pray that they would have an understanding of the greatness of this celebration. And Father, we ask, O oh God, today for our world that is at war and confused and in economic uncertainty, and we pray that the love of God and the peace of Jesus Christ would reach them. On this Peace Sunday, at least here at Seabees Bay, 
May this peace, may the peace of Jesus Christ, may the peace and the Prince of Peace move throughout this world in Jesus' glorious name. Amen. And amen. We're going to talk a little bit about love. Yes, if you're a good Anglican, Catholic, Lutheran, this is Joy Sunday. But because I can take liberty, because I'm not bound by the liturgy of a denomination, um, even though I saw the bishop was watching there uh, he, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the camera there. Anyway, so, you know, but I don't think, I don't think that Pastor Bob cares whether I switch them around a little bit. I felt the Holy Spirit giving me a message about love, and I could think, well, I have to keep that for the next week, but no, I decided this is going to be the week, so we're lighting the love candle instead of the joy candle. Here is what a dictionary defines as love. A profoundly tender, passionate affection for another person. Two, a feeling of warm personal attachment or deep affection as for a parent, a child, or a friend. Here is what the Bible defines as love. Love is patient and is kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud, is not rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable and it keeps no record of being wrong. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. That's a lot better definition than what the world gives in Webster's, even though Brother Webster was a believer. The issue is here that the Bible has a variety of words that in the English language are translated love. And when Paul the Apostle shares this in 1 Corinthians 13, where I'm quoting from, it is the word agape, it is the divine sacrifice that cannot be understood intellectually by human beings. It must be experientially ministered to us. You can't think through it you have to experience it. That is the difference. It's not based on merits and it's not based on reciprocal affection. You see, when two people fall in love, there is reciprocal affection. But divine love, the love of God the Father given through Jesus Christ is not of reciprocal. It means that God gives his love whether it comes back or not, whether we receive it back or not, it is there for us. This afternoon I'm meeting with a couple and I'll be doing pre-marriage counseling with them and, and one of the things I always bring up with a couple is about the differences in the Bible about philios love and agape love and eros love and those other kinds of love that are in the Bible. I've been in the ministry now for <laughs> getting close to 40 years and I did not understand the love of God the Father for me for much of my experience. I can remember the moment when I understood the love of God the Father for me and it was a revelation of the Holy Spirit when I allowed God's love to come in and to flow in me. It was not at my conversion, thank the Lord. God's love was made real to me. It, uh, I'm sure that I understood a little bit more of God's love when I got saved and when I was uh, sanctified, when I was baptized in the Holy Ghost. Uh, certainly the power of God came upon me and manifested many ways, but the love of the Father, I still didn't quite understand God's love. I went to Bible college, I went to seminary, I uh, went and started churches in, in Scarborough and I started church in the Maritimes and I still did not have a full understanding of the love of God the Father for me. And I was starting churches in Ottawa and I was pastoring in, in, in uh, Harmony Church in Winchester. And it wasn't until I remember going to a conference at Cobden Pentecostal Camp 
and it, it was a, not a Pentecostal meeting, it was an interdenominational meeting of pastors, and I remember them talking, the, the message was on the love of the Father for us, and I remember the moment where I allowed the love of God the Father, because I had a poor relationship with my father, and I had a hard time because of my culture, and because of my growing up, I had a hard time to understand the love of the Father. And I remember the moment when I just let the love of God the Father come in, and it just blew my socks off. So friends, we're all in a journey of learning about love. And I don't pretend to say that I have made it, but I have had some lessons. That was one lesson. That was about 15 years ago or more at a camp when I had a lesson about the love of God the Father. But I've had other lessons. Another time I had a lesson of love was when my first child was born. Now, men, and I have a son-in-law that's in this situation now where my daughter is uh, pregnant and going to have a baby in uh, April sometime, the end of April. And, uh, you know, he's okay with it, you know. <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah. He's happy. He, uh, the other day he saw the ultrasound because they won't let them in now. You know, they were, you used to be able, you could go in and see it with your, your wife. But because of COVID and restrictions, blah, 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 they wouldn't let, it, let him in. And now he finally got in and he saw it and, well, this is real, you know. Uh, and he's felt the baby kick. And, and I, I, I've been in that situation too where I felt the baby kick. But something about men, until the baby is put in our hands by the doctor, we go, I'm a father. <laughs> and it goes, oh, this is real. <laughs> Oh, screaming child in me hands. This, this is real. <laughs> and I remember that, well, I love all my kids, but I do remember something special happening spiritually. Uh, I'm a father. And there was a lesson that I learned that I couldn't learn in a book, and I couldn't learn in a seminar, and I couldn't learn in a sermon. I had to learn it in the reality of this wet little baby being placed in my hands. One of the tougher lessons on love is about loving people in ministry when they're a real royal pain in the neck. Neck. Or any other part of the anatomy that you wish to imagine, all right? But we'll say pain in the neck you know, it is, I have had people turn on me who said they love me, and Pastor, you are the most wonderful thing since sliced bread, and we're so glad to have you. And I've started churches in the Maritimes, and in, as I said, and I remember down there especially, they were so glad to have me, and, and people would get uh, saved and come into the church, and they would be so loyal, and then they'd turn on you, and the knives would be in your back. <laughs> And how do I love these people? And as a pastor, I'm supposed to love the people, not just get paid, not just a career, not just a, um, an occupation, but you're supposed to love people. And that isn't always easy, especially if you were raised in a certain way that didn't understand or communicate that kind of affection. But I remember at different times God depositing love for others in my heart. And I'll tell you when it happens. When you pray for people and when you're in touch with God the Father in prayer and you've got somebody that you just don't even like, how do you love them? You pray for them, and God the Father in that prayer will able to deposit in you love for them. The kind of love must come from the chief shepherd. 
Otherwise, pastors and leaders will do this. They will tolerate their congregations. Uh, they will use people to build up their bank accounts and build up their rep to build up their reputation and they will use one church as a stepping stone to get to another church and a stepping stone to get to a bigger church and a bigger church. And this is sometimes the game that pastors play. They start out, in some denominations, they start out as youth pastor. And all that means is that they want to be a, a senior pastor, but they start out as a youth pastor and then they become a assistant pastor, and then they become an associate pastor, and then they become a senior pastor, and they keep working through the church system. They were never called to be a youth pastor. I know youth pastors that are 60 years old because God called them to be youth pastors. And I know others that the youth pastor thing is just because it's a job to get to an assistant, to get to an associate, to get to another level. You got to love the people that God has called you and they're not there just to rub your ego or to build your bank account. Peter understood the need for a supernatural download. He told the elders in 1 Timothy, in 1 Timothy, in 1 Peter chapter 5, he, uh, he, he said to the elders in the church to treat the people as they have been entrusted from the chief shepherd. Here's what he said. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, he says, Shepherd the flock of God which is amongst you, not by compulsion, this is the version that I chose, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. Shepherd the flock of God, not by compulsion, not because you have to, but because you want to. God is having to teach me a new lesson on love. I, um, uh, can I say pride? Because that would be a sin. <laughs> I, 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 an ethic. I, I, have, I have had in my ministry, because I've been a church planter, um, an ethic about finances. Uh, and I have never chosen a church because of finances. I've chosen churches. I started them, so, you know, it was, there was nothing about financial gain. There was nothing about, uh, boy, I need to do something here because I need a new car. I better start a church. Or my family, I'm having another baby, and, and I need more money, so I better, uh, I better grow that church so that I can get that child a bicycle. You know, that has never been part of my ethic. I know, pastors, that that is part of their ethic. I need to grow this church. And in the Maritimes where I was down there, uh, many of the Pentecostal churches especially were uh, percentage uh, churches, which meant they got a percentage of the offering. So, uh, and this was quite common in the Maritimes. And so you got a, you got a percentage. So you were given... Uh, you, would, you would make a contract with the church, I'm going to go get, I get 10% of the offering on Sunday morning. So I know a guy that would start, start to a church that had about 10 people, and he said, uh, I'd like 50% of the offering. I said, 50% of not much isn't much, so sure. So he nearly starved the first three months. He worked like all get out and got people into that church, preached hard, had revival meetings, brought, and then all of a sudden, 50%. Began <laughs> to be pretty good, uh, and then it got better and better, and and he got 150 people in that church, and 50 percent of the offerings every Sunday was was pretty sweet, you know. And so the elders uh, or whatever they had in that particular church went to him and said, you know what, uh, you know, when you start, he says that's the contract. I've got a contract, and and I've seen that kind of greed. So I say. I'm, I'm glad I'm not part of that, but the Lord rebuked me a few, couple of weeks ago. Well, maybe just a week ago. I um, signed up for prison ministry. Some of you know that. You should maybe all know that, that I would go to uh, uh, Joyceville or Collins Bay and, and get a part-time job and, uh, and do prison ministry. And I came at that as this. I need more money so I need another job 
and prison ministry is not far away and I have contacts in that and so I said that's good so I went there and I did one day and enjoyed it and and had a lot of contact with the prisoners and and whatnot and then there was a glitch in my paperwork and I got called uh, and said I'm sorry there's a glitch in your paperwork you can't go back into the prison uh, we'll work it out. We got, you know, from Kingston goes to Fredericton, from Fredericton it goes to Ottawa to the federal government. The federal government sends it back to Fredericton, and then, it, you know, it's, it's, and then it's nobody works on Fridays. They're all working from home if they work. Anyways, that's another thing that I got a problem with, you know. But, anyways, and so it takes time. And so I was praying about this. Lord, I, I went in there. And the Lord convicted me. Why did you want this? Why did you want to go into the prison? Because well, I need the money. What about the prisoners? You got to, aren't you there to minister to them? Aren't you there to love them? Oh, that's right. <laughs> I've always said it's not about the money. And here, I'm going into the jail because I need, in my mind, I need the money. So the Lord rebuked me. And so I said, Lord, I'll confess to you and I'll confess to you as, as my brothers and sisters. I don't know how to love somebody that's murdered two people, butchered their wife, one particular case. I, I don't want to get into details of things. I, I have a, I don't know, Lord, I don't have it in me to uh, love a child molester. I, I don't know if I have it in me. I'd like to take them out anyway. <laughs> you know what I mean? The, 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 I'm going to have to I'm going to have to, if these are my people that you've called me to minister to, then I am going to have to love the murderer, the rapist, the molester, the, the, the guy that swindled little old ladies out of their life savings. I'm going to have to love these people. I don't know if I have it in me, but I know he has it. So, Lord, give me a love so that the love of God is reflected in me and through me to them. You see, we're all still learning <laughs> about the love and what it means. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 12 and 15, he said, I was very gladly, I, he said, I will very gladly spend and be spent. I like that King James, spend and be spent for you. Paul speaking to the church that wasn't the easiest church, they had issues. Ah, oh, they had serious issues. But he said, I would rather, I, would, I, I, will be, I will spend and be spent for your souls, though the more abundantly I love you, the less I am loved by you. Isn't that a whacker? Modern version. Even though the more I love you, the less I get back. Imagine that. You see, that is a reflection of the agape love of God. That is the reflection of the love that this man, this apostle of God, had for the church. He said, you know, I'm telling you hard things, 1 Corinthians. There actually is three letters to the Corinthians. There's 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. But we don't have the 2nd. We only have the 3rd. So the 3rd is our 2nd, okay? There's another letter that's out there which he rebukes them and deals with their sin and so he makes reference to it in the in 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 the in Second Corinthians. But the issue is he has rebuked them. He has dealt with them as a as a leader, as a pastor, and and not everybody liked what Paul had to say. And so he says, "Listen, I will spend and be spent for you." He says, "I will gladly do it for your souls. More abundantly, I love you, even though the less I get back of love from you." 
That says it all right there about ministry, friends. We, we can't do that on our own. That has to be a divine intervention. And that's what Paul did. Paul received it from above so that he could deliver it here below. Lessons on love. First, of course, John chapter 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever would believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's God's lesson to us. First John tells us that God is love. He is the epitome of love. He is the essence of love. I feel sorry for those of other religions because their founders, leaders, <laughs> and prophets are not about love. Buddha, his followers, think that he is wise, but there is nothing in any of the writings of Buddhism that refer to God or Buddha as love. Islam has the five pillars of the faith and believes there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is the prophet of Allah. But if you're looking at the Koran and you read it, you will never find that Allah loves. Allah is merciful, and I have read the Koran. Allah is merciful in the Koran, but he is never loving. Mercy is different than love. Mercy is you're a bug on the floor, and Allah is going to squish you, but not today. <laughs> maybe tomorrow, maybe next week. But his foot, his foot is over you all the time, and at some point, you know, if you do wrong. So there is no love in that. Uh, Confucians or Hinduism and all the other religions of the world do not have a God of love. They have in Hinduism goddesses of love, but it is not divine love, it is actually sexual love. And so it is not, um, it is not the same love. There is no other religion where God comes down and dies because... He loves us so much. Our King and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, He is the one that was born. He is the one that died. He is the one that rose again from the dead. He is the reflection of God the Father who is love. And that Savior gave us one real commandment, he reiterated the old commandments and he re reiterated the Old Testament commandments, but he says this, chapter 13 of John, 34 and 35, now I am giving you a new commandment, love one another, just as I have loved you. You should love one another. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. What a powerful text of scripture that we need to be reminded of. It is a lesson in love. And then Jesus said in the next chapter, in chapter 14, verse 15, he says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you love me, you will be obedient. You will keep the commandments. You will obey is a reflection of your love. That's another lesson in love. It's the proof in the pudding is the way that we love one another and in how we're obedient to the Lord's commands. This church today is echoing with a little bit of emptiness because, in part, we have not learned the lessons about loving one another 
and we have not learned as a community the lessons about being obedient to the Lord's command and loving God. People will say that they love God. They will say that they love the Lord. But Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey me. I say in part, of course, only. And all the churches are in the same thing. We have not learned the lesson of love. Even on this Sunday or next Sunday if you're in most churches where they light the candle of love. The world has taught the church how to love. Does that sound right? It should be us teaching the world. But the world has taught the church how to love and we have learned the lesson of love from the world instead of learning the lesson of love from God the Father. And that is why our love is selfish, weak, twisted, mushy, finicky, temporal, and conditional. We need to understand our understanding of love. Do we really understand what love is? Are we really Jesus' disciples? Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. You, Jesus said, and he said, you have heard the law say, love thy neighbor. And he, not the law, but he said, you've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. I say unto you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you in a way that you will be acting as true children of the Father in heaven, for he gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good. King James, the just and the unjust. And he sends rain upon the, oh, there it is. And he sends rain upon the just and the unjust alike. If you love only those who love you, what reward is there of that? Even corrupt tax collectors do that and more. If you are kind only to your friends, how are you any different from anyone else because even the pagans do that? Ouch! Lord, yeah, ouch. Jesus says that if you don't, there's a lesson. Here's a hard lesson. If you don't love the way I love, that's Jesus saying, you're acting like pagans. Ouch. The last lesson that I'll share is simply what I think we've built up to this is that love is not an option. It's not an option. It's essential for the Christian. If we say we're a Christian, we need to prove it by the way we love. But the problem is not so much knowing that we have to love, but knowing what love is. We have been told by people that they loved us and they stabbed us in the back. They've deserted us. We have been told we are loved and they hurt, and then we're hurt by the very ones who said those words because they were said by people that didn't understand what love was. We have been hurt and ignored, and therefore the world teaches us that love is an optional thing. But God is teaching us that love is not an option. I'm concerned today, people, there are two things that are happening. Uh, well, this country of ours, we have now become the world's leader in what? Well, in economic gas production, oil production, lumber. What are we the world leader in? We are the world leader in assisted suicide. That's our new, you know, Canada's number one. Used to be Holland, used to be some of the European countries. And, you know, now we have taken over. We are growing exponentially in assisted suicide. 
In fact, there's one doctor that set up a clinic in Vancouver that does nothing but assisted suicide. She has now murdered 500 people. One, one doctor in one office has murdered 500 people. And the church has gotten involved, in the United Church in particular, that has crossing over, and I've shared this before, crossing over services where the, they will actually have a, your funeral service, you sit at the front, and then at the end of the service, they stick a needle in your arm and they kill you. Isn't that wonderful? And we have a totally mixed up understanding in our country of what love is. And how do you relate that? Because people are doing this because they're doing it as an act of love. I don't think our country knows what love is. People are distraught. And along with the top Suicide, uh, assisted suicide, which is murder, uh, we also have a growing suicide. You will read once again and again and again in the paper, suddenly, 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 died unexpectedly, died unexpectedly. So many of them, not all of them, but many of those are suicide. Because people don't have other people that are showing love to them. Marilyn Monroe Actually, her name was, I had her name down here. Does anyone know her, her real name? I think I had it. It was Jean somebody. But she took on the stage name Marilyn Monroe. Some of you are old enough to remember Marilyn Monroe. Uh, she, um, she came, rose up quickly through the ranks and became quite popular and, and uh, came from a poor background and, and was alien. She didn't know what love was when she grew up. And when she got involved in the movie industry and and became what was called a sex symbol back in the 60s, or prima donna, or whatever you want to call it. She was hated, actually, by most of the crew and many of the actors she worked with because she, was so, she became hard to deal with. Um... She kept saying, I want to be a person, I want to be a serious actress, but no one was really taking her seriously. All the serious actors didn't really take her seriously. You know, they just, you know, she's just a, just a cute blonde and she'll just, a thing that'll come and fade and go. And, and so she sought desperately for acceptance and sought, sought desperately for love out of the Hollywood crowd. What's that? Norma Jean Mortensen. That was her real name. Norma Jean from a country poor family, Norma Jean. And when she got into Hollywood, actually, of course, uh, at 35 years old on a Saturday night, um, she was by herself. And that is when she took her own life. Her maid came in and found her body the next morning and noticed the telephone was off the hook. And it was dangling there beside her because she was on the phone. And she called up another leading actor and said, I, I've got a bunch of pills. I'm going to take these pills and I'm going to kill myself. And that person said to her, the Rhett Butler uh, from Gone with the Wind expression, frankly, my dear, I don't give a hoot. Go ahead. And she did. That was the last moments of her life. She reached out to somebody and they didn't care and she dropped the phone dangling. What really killed Marilyn Monroe, this love goddess who never found real love. She said she thought the dangling telephone was a symbol. This is what the maid said. A symbol of Marilyn Monroe's whole life. She died because she never got through to anyone who understood what love meant. The church of Jesus Christ and the people of God are to be people who are to understand what love means. It doesn't mean you're going to understand all at once. It doesn't mean the first day you accept Christ, 
you're going to get it all. It's a process. It's a journey. And as I said, even in my own story, it is at times God will reveal, wait a minute, this has got to be about love, not about money, not about this, not about that. We are to be the thing. We are, be, we are to be the people of God who understand love. And we should be trying to understand the love of God more and more. There was a, a gentleman many, many years ago wrote a hymn. The love of God is greater far. And he got it. I believe this guy got an understanding of the love of God. And uh, the last verse was written, Frederick... No, not Frederick. Who, uh, who, um, yeah, Frederick Lehman. Yeah, Frederick Lehman. Um, Mennonite Brethren in Christ, uh, in the denomination that I was part of for 35 years, uh, there's a hall in Kitchener. His, uh, I, got, I have his cousins, who was the district superintendent of the uh, Mennonite Brethren in Christ. I have his sermon notes. And, and so the story is well known amongst the missionary church that this gentleman was in a psychiatric hospital, actually was just a prison. Because it was a cell, it was a jail cell, that's what it was in the early part of the 20th century. And he had anxiety issues, he had whatever issue, there was no pills for it, there was no treatment for it, they just locked you up. And the last verse, which is probably the most powerful verse, was written on the wall of his cell. Even in mental illness, he understood the love of God. Let's stand to sing it. The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. The guilty pair bowed down with care. God gave his son to win. His erring child he reconciled, pardoned from his sin. Oh, love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong, it shall forevermore endure the saints and angels song. When years of time shall pass away, and earthly thrones and kingdoms fall, when men who hear Refuse to pray on rocks and hills and mountains tall. God's love so sure shall still endure, all measureless and strong. Redeeming grace to Adam's race, the saints and angels' song. Oh, love of God, how rich and pure. How measureless and strong It shall forevermore endure The saints and angels song Here's this special verse Could we with ink the ocean fill And were the sky Yes, Lord, of parchment made Were every stock on earth a quill and every man a scribe by trade could write the love of God above, would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. Oh, love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless, and strong it shall forevermore endure the saints and angels song 
The love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong, it shall forevermore endure, the saints' angel song. By George, I think he got it. Lord, help us to get it. Now may the Lord God Almighty bless and keep Encourage our hearts with joy, peace, love, and hope. And prepare us for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Go now and depart with the shalom of God, the peace of God. Go with you all. Amen. Love of God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus.